Next, preserving canal history one lock at a time. And later, Curious Sea Bus explores Columbus's connection to the Ohio Erie Canal. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain, and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you. Thank you. As Columbus is speeding into the future with its designation as a smart city, thoughts of electric cars and driverless vehicles are becoming a reality. And although that's really exciting, the days where travel was a lot slower are not too far behind us. In fact, the Ohio Erie Canal was in operation just a little over 100 years ago here in Columbus. This intricate system was a major mode of transportation to ship goods back and forth, and also powered mills and factories along the way. Even though the function of the canals is long gone, many communities are trying to save the remnants that are left. Architectural historian Jeff Darby visited Groveport and Lockbourne to find out how they are actively saving their canal history. We're on a journey today. We're not going to travel on a canal, but we're going to go learn about the Ohio and Erie Canal. So we're going to visit uh, part of the Ohio and Erie Canal here in Groveport, known as Lock 22. A canal lock was a stone structure intended to uh, enable canal boats to make a change in elevation. Ohio, uh, contrary to what a lot of people think, is a hilly state. It's not a flat state. Uh, and the canal had to overcome something like 150 different points between uh, Cleveland and Portsmouth where it had to go up or down a hill. And the only way to do it is to have an enclosed chamber with doors on it where you could fill it with water and then put a boat in it, close the doors, uh, drain the water out to lower the boat to another level or reverse the process to take it to a higher level. So we're going to visit block number 22 on the portion of the Ohio and Erie Canal that's known as the Southern Descent. Uh, it started uh, in Newark at a higher level and descended through a series of locks all the way down to the Ohio River at Portsmouth. And the city of Groveport has taken on the preservation of Lock 22 uh, as an important part of its historic character and its historic story that the, the community tells because it had so much to do with the founding of Groveport itself. Hi, Rick. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. How you doing? Good to see you. Nice to see you, too. How are you? Hi, Rick. Good to see you yeah. here, here at Lock 22. Lock in 22 Groveport. in Groveport. Look at all that stonework. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so we're at the upper end of the lock, where it would have been the upstream end. This is the east end. Mm -hmm. And now Winchester is that way. OK. And then this is where you'd lower the boats if they're headed down toward Portsmouth. Correct. OK. Well, let's take a walk through the lock, since we can, and, uh, and talk about it a little more. Okay. Now, these were built on wood foundations, is that right? Correct. Uh, the wood floor is still in this lock. Um, I dug around one day and rediscovered it, and it's still there. The wood floor, as long as you keep it wet, will stay preserved and still hold its function. Which is why the city used the gravel here, so when it rains, it goes through down and keeps the right. floor wet, but doesn't let it evaporate. It works like a cereal bowl. Yeah, yeah. Like when you pour the milk on cereal, the water goes through and gets down below and keeps everything wet. And then the boards go up underneath the okay. walls and well, I'm sure holds everything people look at these big stones and can't imagine that it's built on a wood foundation, but that was the technology at the time. Correct. And you know, it's been what, almost 200 years yes. <laughs> that this wood has been in place. And it's so still doing its job. Doing its job because the walls are straight. Right. If the wood fails, and then you, you can see some of the mason's marks here on the, on the walls yes. where they finish the surfaces. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes they have little margins at the edge. It really is, in ways, it's a work of art. Yeah. It really is. So we're, we're here down by the floor, so the boat's getting lowered in the lock. The bottom of the boat might be somewhere like here, a little bit above the floor. Correct. So it probably was a six or eight foot 
drop or a rise if you're going the other direction. At least. And then the wood, you, you don't see them anymore because wood exposed the way the gates were, will rot away. But those pockets is where you would see the yeah, gates. Yeah, you can is still see right? the notches where the, the gates were on both mm -hmm. ends. And they were essentially watertight. Right. But had With wickets at the bottom. And okay, the water so, ran and out. so you'd open those and the water would go in or out, either right. flow down from above, um, or you'd leave it, leave it lowered, bring the boat in, open it up at the other end, let the boat float up. Correct. And that's how the lock worked. That's exactly how it worked. Well, Kathy, you've been involved a long time now, and I know in uh, Underground Railroad history. That's a, you're you're yes. sort of the queen of Underground Railroad <laughs> history here in Ohio. Uh, but tell me about what happened with canals. What, what got you into canals? Well, what got me interested in canals was simply a friend of mine and I, we took a bus tour from Fairfield County to Salada County, and we were looking at canal features. And the first time I saw a lock was the one in Fairfield County. Mm -hmm. And really I had no idea what it was, a f what it was for or <laughs> how it was used. It was just a bunch of rocks, you know, to me, but they were just quite fascinating. But the more we looked at locks and the more I started reading the markers, like there's a marker, you know, mm -hmm. for lock 22, I started to realize what an expansive operation this had to be. I mean, just the sheer engineering feat of building the canal, I was just awestruck by the history of it. But as I started to see each of these locks, I felt that they needed to be preserved. You know, some of them are in very good condition, such as Groveport's lock is wonderful. It is. There are the others best. that, you know, need a lot of work. You know, there may be trees growing through a side or uh, lock stones missing. So that led to your calling these communities together, Groveport and some of the other communities on what we're calling the what was called the Southern Descent. We're calling it that too. Yes. It's now a historic district. Yes. Listed in the National Register of Historic Places. I think there are what 14 canal features that are now listed and recognized as being important. Yes. In the history of the state, history of transportation and economic development of Ohio. And, of and you really got that going. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> Just to see these massive structures now be preserved and have markers to tell the tales the story so people can understand just what it took to build a canal, how the Ohio's canals were so important to the economy right. at that time. Right. I just felt it was important to save these structures um, because th that's all that's left. Well, Kathy, I know Groveport has made a big commitment here preserving Lock 22, but it's not the only community. I think the next major one down the road is Lockbourne in Southern oh, yeah, Franklin yeah. County. Oh, yeah, and yeah, I'd like to take you down there and see that. Um, they have uh, four locks, a guard lock, and part of the Columbus Feeder. And, well, uh, they, boy, that's quite a complex. That's well, quite a complex. We better go get a look. Yeah, we, let's go get a look. All right. Hi, Dave. Hi, Mayor. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you doing? Good seeing you. Hi. So here we are in Lockbourne, uh, famous, famous for the locks, and Lock 30 being one of the better preserved ones. Right. It, uh, it's part of the whole system that uh, came from the Licking Summit, uh, which we now call the Buckeye Lake, right. and uh, fed water here all the way to southern descent at Ohio River. Well, we were in Groveport, and um, the lock 22 is there. This is lock 30, so there were eight locks between Groveport yes, and here. So there, there was, were. There was quite a change in elevation, but I was wondering, the canal never went to Columbus. It was the capital, uh, but no, never, the, never went to the capital city. What's right. the reason? The, uh, it, when the canal was laid out in 1822, 23, uh, it bypassed Columbus, but uh, in fact, uh, it had a feeder. Columbus feeder that was 11 and three quarters mile long from just a few hundred yards down here all the way up along the Scioto River, edge of the Scioto River into the uh, central part of Columbus. So it joined here at, at Lockport. Yes, so this it was did. a major junction at one point. Yes, it was. It was a major junction. And we're in a public park here. It's it's owned by the, the, the village of Lockbourne. Yes, it is. Uh, and I understand there's another lock. Number 29 is kind of in the distance. It's on the other side of the park um, by Lockbourne Road. And there's a trail that connects them, is that correct? Yes. We have um, collaborated with Metro Parks, Columbus Parks, and Pickaway County Parks. Oh, great. And so what we're doing is we're putting a walking trail along the now path. Um, so you'll be able to go around lock 29 mm -hmm. up to lock 30 and then across the canal towpath all the way into Pickaway County. 
And then from that point, Pickaway County wants to take it to Lock 31, which is in Millport, and right. then continue down the canal into Portsmouth eventually. Well, that goes to what Kathy's been working on, all of these communities coming together to sort of take advantage of these historic features now that they're all officially listed as historic. Right. Um, taking advantage of them for recreation, for getting the history of the canal better known. So Lockbourne is definitely part of that. And it was very easy because all of the entities were so um, excited about the history of their law. Yeah. And so it was almost like everybody was waiting, you know. It just, to, they just needed to get to meet it, each other. It, right, they just <laughs> needed to meet each other to see what they all had in common. Well, let's take a look at the lock. Um, the details are always interesting. Um, this is sandstone, um, as most of the locks were, is that right? That is true. All these uh, on the Ohio and uh, Erie Canal are sandstone. And on the Miami and Erie, they use limestone, but all this through here is sandstone. Right now, it looks like it's pretty stable. It's fairly decent, uh, and there are some areas on each end where there were wooden gates, right. which made the lock work. And those were pretty standard dimensions, weren't they? Wasn't it around 100 feet or so? That uh, it the was lock not. Uh, the interior part, the ch what was called the chamber of the lock, was 90 foot long and 15 foot wide. Okay, and that just that just fit a boat, right? You wanted, that, to, you wanted to put as little water as possible into the lock. Right. So you don't waste it. Right, so it still it, took about 60,000 gallons to do a complete lock through. Really, either going up or down. Up or down, okay. yes. Okay, 60,000, that's a lot of water. Yes, it Cause was. Because water supply was a constant issue, wasn't right. it? Right, uh, particularly here, uh, because uh, periodically you had to add water as we did just down the way from the uh, Big Walnut Creek, mm -hmm. uh, water would enter, and that's why it was called a feeder. Right. It fed water into the Ohio. And well, that was the out. official name of the Columbus branch, wasn't it? The Columbus feeder? Columbus all, feeder, all the exactly All the boats could use right. it as well. And then the big stones on top, the animals that would haul the boats wouldn't walk on the stones. They'd be on a separate gravel path right. for, they to were protect on their a, feet. They were a 10-foot wide, what was called a tow path. Okay. They were usually for most boats, if you were loaded, uh, about three in tandem. Was that horses, mules, both? Both. And there was only a certain speed they could go, what, four miles right. an hour? Is four right? miles an hour was the maximum, and that was so that the banks, which were man-made, would not be washed away. So mm -hmm. uh, most boats went somewhere between two and three miles per hour. Probably a fast the walking, walk. Probably the walking speed of a horse or mule exactly. anyway. So. Exactly right. So a 308 mile trip from Cleveland to Portsmouth was several days. Several days usually. Yep. Uh, yep. But it must have been a pleasant way to travel. Well, it was, it was very quiet, uh, no noise, unlike railroads and cars and yeah. things we have today. It was very quiet and very peaceful. Well, yeah, and you mentioned the railroads. Of course, they're the reason the canals began to get eclipsed almost as soon as they were finished. Well, right, but early on, uh, most of the uh, railroads in the state of Ohio went east to west because right. most of the goods were in the eastern part and the canals went north to south. So there was a period of time where they worked together too. Mm -hmm. So that's why, even though most of the railroads started out in the 1850s, the canals continued to go till the 1900s. And it, it really meant economic development for exactly. parts of the state, especially the southern part of the state. M many towns owe their very existence, Groveport being one of them, to the canal system. Yeah, because the canal went through there, yeah. that's right. You know, Jeff, you mentioned uh, economic tourism, and that was one of the features I was thinking about when we were working on the National Register nomination. Sure, you know? right, to get recognition, to bring awareness. Absolutely, you and have a, a economic, a tourism, cultural tourism, um, heritage tourism, you know, it's just great heritage about the canal, you know. And people are interested in this. They, they want to have those authentic experiences and, and see truly historic places. Um, so, yeah, places like Lockbourne are right on the cutting edge of right. giving people what they want from a recreational kind of educational standpoint, cultural standpoint. It's a good thing you're, you're, you're building that uh, Magnolia Trail, because yes. that's going to bring people in town. We already have some folks that come through just to look at the locks, but we think this will bring more people in. Yeah, that's great. And um, it'll be an educational trail as well, so if they want to learn about the history, they can. So I've learned so much about the southern descent of the Ohio and Erie Canal. There's a northern descent up toward Cleveland. I'll be going there up to Roscoe Village near Coshocton, and I think maybe a canal boat ride. So I think I'll be learning even more about the Ohio and Erie Canal. But thank you so much for what you've given us today. Uh, what we've learned about the canal, and uh, good luck with the future. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks for coming. Enjoy it.
Next, the history of the Columbus feeder and the goods transported through it. And then, Jeff Darby continues his canal adventures. Make sure to stick around as Jeff Darby continues his canal tour to historic Roscoe Village. But first, Curious Seabus answers a viewer's question about the history of the Columbus feeder as part of the Ohio Erie Canal. Curious Seabus is WOSU's project where you submit your questions about our region, its people, or its history, and we assign a reporter or producer to investigate it. Today's question takes us back to a time before automobiles or even trains were the preferred mode of transportation in our state. In the early part of the 19th century, as more and more land was being developed for agriculture, farmers faced the challenge of how to get their harvest to markets outside Ohio. So the idea for a canal system connecting Lake Erie to the Ohio River was met with great enthusiasm. The Ohio Erie Canal went from Cleveland in the north to Portsmouth in the south, creating a trade route that cut through the eastern and central part of the state, but didn't travel through Columbus. So a feeder canal was designed to gain access to that canal. This led one curious citizen to write in with the question, when was the canal feeder to Columbus in use, and what were the major goods transported on the canal boats? Construction of the Columbus feeder canal began in 1827 and took four years to complete. The canal was about 40 feet wide and four feet deep. It traveled from the center of Columbus, about 11 miles south, to the town of Lockbourne, where it connected to the Ohio Erie Canal. The boats were pulled by horses or mules and had a top speed of about five miles per hour. Shipping cargo on roads by horse and carriage was faster, but canal transport was much less expensive. The canal system put the state government deep in debt, but led to a period of great prosperity for Franklin County farmers and manufacturers. In addition to transportation, the canals provided water power for mills and factories. According to the book, A History of Ohio Canals, published in 1905, the main products shipped on the canals included corn, wheat, oats, tobacco, flour, pork, whiskey, coal, iron ore and lumber, as well as assorted merchandise. Unfortunately, the era of the canal didn't last long. The steam engine was revolutionizing transportation, and the Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati Railroad Line was open for business in 1851. Just a few years later, the canals were no longer profitable. Trains were not only much faster, but didn't suffer the drawbacks canals faced. Flooding in the warmer months and ice in the winter caused serious damage to the canal infrastructure. Still, boats traveled the canals for another half century. The Columbus Feeder Canal was abandoned in 1904, and the rest of the Ohio Erie Canal was almost entirely out of use shortly thereafter. Do you have a question for Curious Sea Bus? Head over to WOSU.org slash curious to submit your idea, vote on which question we should investigate next, and see what we've covered so far. You know, I have to say, the more I learn about the history of the Ohio Erie Canal, I'd love to go back in time to experience it. Well, you are in luck because the next leg of Jeff Darby's canal tour takes us to a town that still has an operating canal boat experience. I'm in. Road trip. Here you go. About an hour and a half northeast of Columbus uh, on Route 16 is uh, the city of Coshocton, the seat of uh, Coshocton County. And across the river from downtown Coshocton is a little village called Roscoe Village. And the reason it's here is because of the Ohio and Erie Canal. When the canal came through back in the 1830s, it was on the west side of the river, and the city of Coshocton's on the east side. So Roscoe grew up around the canal terminus. It's sort of a living museum, you might say. You can visit all the historic buildings. Uh, there's some nice, very nice restaurants. Uh, various shops and definitely uh, is a place worth seeing and you learn a lot about canal history here. So here we are in Roscoe Village and I think we're going to have a very nice visit today. Hello, hi, 
Hi, Stacy. Well, hello. Good to see you. Hi. How are you? It's good Jeff to Derby. see you too. Welcome to Roscoe Village. Thank you. Well, it's such a great place. There's so much history here. I've been here a few times, but I have a feeling you can tell me more detail than I know. Oh, I'm sure I um, can. This rustic old building, the red one over here, for example, that's a blacksmith? Yes, it is. Actually this is, working. This is our blacksmith shop, yes. It was built uh, around 1890, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a fellow inside here working quite hard over an open fire. I'm glad it's such a working place. It is. Let's go down this direction. Now, I know this is called White Woman Street. Where did that name come from? Yes, that's very interesting as well. This used to be an old Indian trail right down the middle of where our street is located mm -hmm. now. And uh, several Indian tribes had raided Deerfield, Massachusetts, okay. and they took several captives. One of the captives that they took lived in a town that was known also as White Woman Town and her real name was Mary Harris. We had a land scout in 1751 that came through here. He was very surprised to find a white woman already living <laughs> in the area. She uh, enjoyed her time with the Indians. They treated her very well. Isn't that interesting? Yes. That was, you said that was in the 1700s. Yes, it was. <laughs> and the name Roscoe, tell me where that came from. Well, William Roscoe was an abolitionist poet from England. Mm -hmm. He probably never knew there was a town named after him. The original <laughs> name of the town was Caldersburg. Early Caldersburg was more of the southern end of Roscoe. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were some dignitaries here that were petitioning the state to have the canal come through our area. And they decided Caldersburg has a very old sound to it. <laughs> we need something peppy, something new. And so they really liked that name, Roscoe. Well, that's interesting. So Roscoe predated both Coshocton itself and the canal. Yes, that's true. Well, it's, I didn't know that. Now this building here, it says the toll house on the sign. Tell me about that. Right, this was the toll collector's house. Okay. One of our first toll collectors was Jacob Welsh. And this home was built in 1840, so the canal boats would stop, pay the toll that was owed for using the locks, of course. Okay. The building right here was an old warehouse. Oh, this is a wonderful building, too. We it saw is. it coming into town, and it, uh, the stone pillars are really unusual. And the fact that it's preserved so well. Yes. And it's now a restaurant, is that correct? It is a restaurant. And this is not the only nice old building. There are several others across the street. Yes, um, indeed. With those step gables, that's a sure sign of early architecture. Oh, it is. The one right here on the corner, that was our old hotel. Oh, it was. You can see up above the balcony, it's said that the women would stand up on the balcony and wait for their husbands to return back home, perhaps on the stagecoach or on the canal boats. And I saw over here, there's a little red cottage that looks really interesting. Tell, oh, me, that, tell me about that. It certainly is. That one was originally built in 1825. Mm -hmm. That was the home of Daniel Boyd. He was our weaver here in Roscoe. He did pretty much all of the cloth making. All of the cloth making, yes. So you've had sort of individuals who are expert on all the different needs of the community. Yes. Blacksmith, yes. the weaver, doctor taking care of people, the right. storekeepers. Right. So it was sort of a highly specialized workforce and it everybody was. sort of supported everybody else. Yes, they did. They had to before the canal boats came through here. It had to be a self-sufficient community as, as much as it could. Well, thank you very much. I've learned so much about Roscoe and more about the canal, um, and more than I knew before. Um, but of course, it feels a little incomplete unless I actually experience the canal. There's a, there's a, a boat ride that I think we can take. Oh, Isn't there that right? certainly is. Well, You're going to love the boat ride. Let's head that way then. <laughs> All right. Oh, look at this out on deck, out in the sun and the breeze. It's beautiful. Oh, what a great ride this is. Four miles an hour feels pretty good compared it to does, being on the highway. It? <laughs> it does. This is much more charming than a freeway. It certainly is. Very relaxing. <laughs> and it doesn't look like it taxes the horses very much. Are they, uh, they're just strolling. They are strolling <laughs> along. Do you know how long this piece of the canal is? This is about a mile and a half Isn't section really? that they've restored. Wow, that's great. We'll go down to the end to a basin and then they'll turn the boat around okay. and we'll come right back to the same boat landing. Well, this has been just great learning what it's like to actually to be on the canal. You know, you understand the history, 
Uh, the fact that the canal boats ran day and night. Uh, people actually slept, ate on board, they didn't get off the boat, they just continued on. So to really experience what it's like, knowing some canal history, but really experiencing it has been something really special. So thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome, thank you. Oh man. What are you watching? A 360 video of the canal boat ride Jeff Darby just rode on. Well, I guess Columbus Neighborhoods is really going high tech. Yep, and you can see an extended version of Jeff Darby's canal boat ride in 360 right now on Columbus Neighborhoods Facebook page. That's really Check fun, let me see. And don't forget, you can also catch this episode on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus see all our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You got to try this. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. This is so cool. Seeing everything they saw. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain, and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you, thank you.